Okay, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jason Keller. Dr. Keller is the interim dean of the Smith College of Science and Technology at Chapman University. He earned his PhD in biological sciences from the University of Notre Dame and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. His ongoing research engages undergraduate collaborators in the investigation of carbon cycling in a variety of wetland ecosystems, ranging from peatlands in Minnesota to salt marshes in California. The title of tonight's talk is Exploring Blue Carbon in California Salt Marshes. Please help me welcome Dr. Jason Keller. Well, great, thank you so much, and thank you for the, the opportunity to be here tonight. I'll confess that this is my, my first time at the aquarium. And so I drove over from Orange a little bit early to avoid traffic, uh, got here thinking I'd have plenty of time to practice my talk, and instead realized that there is a beautiful beach right outside the front door. Uh, and so the good news is I'm feeling very relaxed. Uh, the bad news is this isn't rehearsed at all. So we're gonna, we're gonna see how it goes. Uh, I want to talk to you tonight about, about blue carbon. This is carbon that's stored in wetland ecosystems, and we'll get into a little bit more of a formal definition as we go on here. Uh, I want to try and make the case that this is a really important topic for wetland conservation. This is a topic that wetland ecologists are thinking about. This is a topic that uh, coastal managers are thinking about quite a bit. Um, and so I think there's some really interesting uh, policy implications and some really interesting conservation implications of the work tonight. So this is going to be a talk about, uh, about wetlands. And so I always like to start off with a, a generic definition of wetlands just to make sure that we're all on the same page. This is the wetlands de uh, definition that's used by the United States Army Corps of Engineers as well as the United States EPA. And it's been used for several decades now for regulatory purposes. This is the legal definition of wetlands. And you can spend some time reading it or you can look at the large uh, green word in the, middle of the in the middle of the screen and get the gist of it. Uh, wetlands, not surprisingly, are lands that are wet. Uh, these are ecosystems that are transitional. They're not quite an upland ecosystem, but they're not quite an aquatic ecosystem. They don't look like a terrestrial ecosystem, and they don't look like a marine ecosystem. They're somewhere in between. And this in-between transitional nature of wetlands it is what really makes them such fascinating ecosystems to study. But more important, I think, than sort of a formal definition of wetlands is the connotation of wetlands, right? I think that the first point I want to make tonight is that the way that we think about wetlands and the way that we have historically thought about wetlands has everything to do with the conservation status of wetlands in Southern California and beyond. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is just take a second and, and think of a wetland. Think of a wetland that you visited. Maybe it's the one right outside of the aquarium door here. Or the larger challenge is to think of a wetland that shows up in popular culture somewhere. What are the wetlands that we can recognize from literature? What are the wetlands that we can recognize from movies? How do we think about wetlands as a society? And so I can tell you that there is uh, one correct answer to that question. Uh, and the, the correct answer to what wetlands defines how we think about wetlands as a society is, is this one. And if you don't know what this is, you should get out. Uh, this, is, this is Dagobah. This is from the Star Wars universe. This is where Yoda lives. And I think this is a great example of how we as a society have viewed wetlands. Because think of the connotations of this place. This is a place where Yoda lives only because if he lived anywhere else, the Empire would hunt him down and kill him. Right? When you land here as Luke Skywalker, the first thing that happens is your X-Wing sinks into this giant mud puddle and a giant snake thing eats your R2 unit. This is not a happy place, right? And I think this negative connotation to wetlands is something that we see over and over again in society. Other examples of this, Shrek Swamp. Why does Shrek live in a swamp? Because nobody would ever come bother you if you lived in a swamp because it is an awful place to live. We see this not just in popular culture, we see this in language. How many of you have ever been swamped at work? How many of you have ever been bogged down in a problem? How many of you have ever been mired in a situation that you wanted to get out of? Right? The very way that we have incorporated wetlands into our language suggests that we have historically viewed these places in a negative light. We view wetlands as in the way. 
they slow down progress. We're swamped at work because something is getting in the way of what we want to do. And it turns out that that view of wetlands, that relatively negative view of wetlands that's existed for quite some time, has huge implications for how we have treated these wetlands on the landscape. And let me give you a local example of what that implication looks like. So you'll see an image very similar to this in the aquarium exhibits. Uh, you should recognize where we are here. This, uh, this is us. We're at this little red triangle here. Uh, this is the port. Here's Seal Beach, right? This is Southern California, uh, Long Beach Harbor right here, right? This is what it looked like around 1850 or so. And we know this because around 1850, the United States government very precisely mapped the entire coastline of the United States for shipping purposes. And so as a part of that, we have this great historical information of what this landscape looked like around 1850. If you have a landscape like this, which has some substantial wetland complexes on it, but you view those wetlands as in the way, you view those wetlands as an inherently negative part of the landscape, what do you think happens to those wetlands? Well, what happens to those wetlands is that we now have a landscape that looks something like this, right? They've disappeared from the landscape. They've been converted to other uses. And let me be clear, it's not as if these other uses don't have value, right? Certainly the port has value. Certainly the marina has value. But so did the wetlands before us, right? And if your only view of wetlands is that they're negative, snake-filled, disease-ridden places that you want to get rid of, of course you make all efforts to get rid of them. Okay, and just to sort of drive this home with one more image, here's the satellite image of the same area, right? So that area that had these three really nice wetland complexes, this one's gone, this one's gone. The only one that remains is down here at Seal Beach. Anybody want to guess why the one at Seal Beach remains? There's a naval weapons station there, right? This is not a wetland that's able to be developed because there is a ballistic testing site right in the middle of it. Okay? So I'm going to make the argument that this negative view of wetlands and the way that we think about wetlands is evidenced by popular culture, as evidenced by the way that we talk about wetlands in the English language, has a lot to do with the way that we've treated wetlands on our landscape. I'm going to suggest that, fortunately, uh, and let me just say that this is, this is not just a, a, a Los Angeles problem. This sort of loss of wetlands from the landscape is the, is the norm, not the exception. When we look at Southern California, as sort of highlighted here in this orange box, we know that since the 1800s, we've lost 75% of the coastal salt marshes that existed here. That means that we've lost 6,000 hectares of salt marshes in the past 200 and some odd years. That is something like 12,000 football fields worth of salt marshes that no longer exist on the landscape. When we scale up to the entire state of California, we know that we've lost something like 90% of the wetlands that existed here prior to European settlement. We're talking about something like 4 million football fields worth of wetlands that used to be in California that are no longer in California. And of course they're not. If you view that 4 million football fields of wetlands as in the way, we're going to work really hard to get rid of those wetlands. When we scale up even further to the lower 48 of the United States, we know that we've lost something like 50% of the wetlands that existed on that landscape. We're talking about almost 100 million football fields worth of wetlands that were in the United States around 1850 that no longer exist within the landscape of the United States. And again, I suggest that this has everything to do with the fact that we viewed these things as, as in the way of progress. And so what's happened more recently right, in large part because of people like you, I suspect, is that our perception of wetlands have started to change, right? We can now begin to appreciate that not all wetlands look like Dagobah. They're not all dark, scary places that we want to get rid of. I think increasingly as a society, we recognize that we can have a different perspective of wetlands. We can th start to think of wetlands that look like this. This is Upper Newport Back Bay, a beautiful site, right? This really nice area in an otherwise urban Southern California environment that offers us all sorts of benefits, right? There's recreational benefits here, there's birding benefits here, a lovely place to bike ride, a lovely place to kayak. And if this is your perspective of wetlands, if these are no longer dark, scary places, but instead sunny, happy places, that probably changes the way that wetlands get treated on our landscape. Mm -hmm. 
Along with this appreciation that these places can be really wonderful recreational opportunities is a growing appreciation by the scientific community and I think society more broadly that these wetlands also provide us with any number of ecosystem services. Which is to say that the communities that live close to these wetlands have very real benefits from having these wetlands around. There is value in maintaining the 10% of wetlands that are left, not just because they're beautiful, but because we are actually getting something out of that wetland uh, ecosystem. And a couple examples of this. One, one is that we know that these places are incredibly valuable habitats, and I'm glad I picked bird examples, seeing who the audience is today. Uh, we know that wetlands uh, are just amazing habitat for birds, right? Uh, this includes all sorts of threatened and endangered species. But it's not just bird habitat for birders, this is also habitat for things like commercial fish and commercial shellfish population. These wetland ecosystems that exist in our lands on our landscape are supporting millions if not billions of dollars worth of commercial fisheries by providing habitat for the fish that live in these transitional environments. We increasingly realize that wetlands provide important protection to our coasts. These are ecosystems that can filter water before it enters into the marine environment. They basically act as the kidneys of the landscape, cleaning our pollution out of water before it goes into the ocean. And they serve as a physical protection from storm events. And there's a growing appreciation that one of the ways that we can help offset the impacts of hurricanes and typhoons is by putting wetlands back on the coast. Rather than building a big cement wall here to protect this community, we could instead put a salt marsh there. And that salt marsh is going to act like a giant sponge, absorb storm energy associated with coastal storm events, providing very tangible, very real economic benefits for the communities behind it. And this is, again, this shift in perception. These are not negative places that we want to get rid of. Instead, we've started to realize that these are systems that have lots of positive benefits, and maybe we want to conserve the ones that we have left, or possibly even restore some of the ones that we've lost back onto the landscape. So what we, I think, has happened in the last several decades is that as we look at these historical ecology images, we're beginning to appreciate that as we went from this historical landscape to the landscape that we have today, we didn't just lose wetland area, right? What we lost was wetland function. And that shift in appreciation and that shift in perception is really driving a lot of conservation and restoration efforts in coastal zones around the world. And in particular, one service or one value that we know that these wetlands provide to us as a society has to do with carbon. And so we'll transition now to talk a little bit about this idea of blue carbon. This is an ecosystem service that right now is a very hot topic of conservation managers and coastal managers. This is a service that we think we might be able to capitalize on to start to put some of these missing wetlands back into our landscape. And so blue carbon is the carbon that is stored in coastal wetland environments. This is the carbon that is stored in the vegetation and the carbon that is stored in the soils of ecosystems like salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrass beds. These are coastal wetland ecosystems that are known to absorb large quantities of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it for long periods of time. Store it for on the scale of centuries, if not millennia. Okay? And a little bit of biogeochemistry here to help explain how this works. So if you'll remember your high school biology, you know that all plants undergo photosynthesis. And as they undergo photosynthesis, what they're doing is they're taking carbon dioxide, this important greenhouse gas. This is the greenhouse gas responsible for about 60% of anthropogenic global warming on the planet. Plants take that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they turn it into organic matter. They turn it into leaves and sticks and roots. Now in most ecosystems, those plants will die and be decomposed by soil microbes, right? The microbes are eating these dead plants as food. Much like us, soil microbes that eat dead plants as food are releasing carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And in a fully terrestrial ecosystem, so in a forest or in a prairie, the amount of carbon dioxide that comes in and the amount of carbon dioxide that goes out are more or less equal to each other. So there's no net storage of carbon in that ecosystem. 100 pounds of carbon dioxide comes in, 
100 pounds of carbon dioxide goes out. But in wetland ecosystems, something very different happens. In wetland ecosystems, this decomposition is slow, which means that more carbon dioxide can come into the ecosystem than leaves the ecosystem. And essentially what this means is that all of this organic matter, all of these dead plants, can build up over time in the soil of these ecosystems. So the imbalance between carbon coming in and carbon going out leads to this large accumulation of blue soil carbon in these coastal ecosystems. And these coastal ecosystems, salt marshes, mangroves, seagrass beds, are really, really good at this, right? They win the competition for being able to store carbon, and they blow everybody else out of the water. So this is a graph from one of the articles that's on the table in the back, so well done, um, showing the carbon burial rate per meter squared per year in a variety of ecosystems around the planet. And so what this says is that if you have a given area of a tropical forest or a temperate forest or these blue carbon ecosystems, this is how much carbon that given area can store for hundreds of years each year. How good are these things are, are these different ecosystems at burying carbon? Okay? And there's a pattern here that should pop out right away for those of you that are quantitative and like to read graphs. Which ecosystems win? Is it the forests or is it the blue carbon ecosystems? It's the blue carbon ecosystems. And how much do they win by? Are they storing twice as much, two times as much carbon per meter squared per year? Look carefully at the axis, says the uh, faculty member at the front of the room. Uh, Notice that this is, not, this is not a linear axis. This is not going 1, 2, 3, 4. This is going 1, 10, 100. So the forest, right, the lushest, the densest tropical forest that you can imagine, right? These are the rainforests in South Africa, right? These big, dense tropical systems. They're down here, less than 10. Salt marshes are up here over 100. Right? These blue carbon ecosystems are 10, if not 100 times better at storing carbon than any other ecosystem on the planet. These systems are incredibly effective of taking that greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere and storing it below ground in their soils for centuries, if not millennia. Okay? And why is that? Let's talk just a little bit about the ecology of this. How many people have ever seen this image before? This is a bog mummy. Do people know what these are? So this is a, this is a, a bog mummy found in a, a very different type of wetland, not a salt marsh. This is found in a freshwater ecosystem just outside of Denmark. Uh, Tolenmand, we know that he died in the year 400 BC. He was discovered uh, in the year 1950. So this is a 2,000-year-old body. This is remarkable preservation for a 2,000-year-old body. Right? We can still see his leather hat. We can see the stubble on his chin. We have some clues as to what might have happened to this person. This suspicious looking noose around his neck gives us <laughs> some forensic insights into what was going on here. So I tell my students there's, there's a good life lesson here. If you're going to go into a life of crime, do not dispose of your evidence in wetland ecosystems. Get rid of it in a forest. The evidence persists for thousands and thousands of years. The same thing that preserves this body, you know, this Dane, is exactly the same thing that preserves dead vegetation and blue carbon ecosystems. And the reason that this happens is because wetlands are wet, right? And in the presence of water, there's no oxygen. And so all of the soil microbes, all of the bacteria and the fungus that exist in a forest ecosystem and would chew this body up and get rid of the evidence very, very quickly in an upland ecosystem, in a forest or a prairie or coastal sage scrub, they're breathing oxygen in the same way that we're breathing oxygen. That's how they consume the organic matter. It's the exact same biochemistry as, as, as how we breathe. As soon as you put this dead Dane or as soon as you put dead vegetation below the water table, there's still microbes there, but those microbes no longer have access to oxygen. And so the lack of oxygen, the anaerobic or anoxic conditions in wetland soils, slows down decomposition dramatically. This is the, why the Titanic exists at the bottom of the ocean when the Titanic would not exist had it crashed in a forest. 
right? The lack of oxygen often combined with cold conditions and acidic conditions in some wetlands, but primarily the lack of oxygen slows down decomposition. It allows for the accumulation of bog bodies. It allows for the accumulation of soil carbon in wetlands around the world. Now the other thing that these coastal ecosystems have, besides being anoxic and having slow rates of decomposition because they're wet, is that coastal ecosystems are on the coast. And being on the coast, they are constantly faced with this uh, presence of sea level rise. And so if you're a salt marsh and you exist along the coast and the sea level rises, and things are working well and you're in a fully functional landscape and we haven't urbanized the entire landscape, a variety of biological, ecological, and geo, uh, geophysical processes occur that allow that wetland to grow to keep pace with sea level rise. And this is unique to coastal systems. So coastal systems store carbon because they're anoxic. And in addition, they're constantly adding new layers of soil, right, in ways that a forest can't, or that a freshwater wetland that doesn't have this tidal connectivity, the sea level rise, can't. And so it's this combination of very slow decomposition and the ability to store new layers of carbon every single year, those two factors are what makes these blue carbon ecosystems 10 or hundreds of times better at storing carbon than any other ecosystem on the planet. Okay, so who cares, right? A very, a very fair question. Um, this is fascinating if you are an anaerobic carbon biogeochemist, but uh, there's only one of those people in the room tonight, and so nobody else is, is particularly impressed by anoxic biochemistry. Why this matters is that as we start to move towards uh, policies, right, and laws and regulations that value greenhouse gas removal from the atmosphere, that has conservation implications. And this is starting to happen in California and around the world. So we are now at a place where environmental policy has established a variety of different carbon markets or carbon, trap, uh, carbon cap and trade systems. Essentially, we have multiple markets around the world, including here in California, that treat carbon like stocks. You can buy and sell carbon in California. And this is done to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the state. And there's similar policies that exist on global levels and, and some national levels as well. And these carbon markets then create an opportunity for wetland conservation and restoration. If carbon has a dollar value, and if wetlands are better at storing carbon than any other ecosystem on the planet, that means that you can conserve or restore wetland ecosystems and potentially generate revenue from the carbon that that wetland is stored. That then helps you use that revenue to continue to conserve and restore more wetlands and maybe put some of the 50% of the wetlands that we've lost in the United States and all of the services they provide to us back on the landscape. Now we're still in the very early days of this, and so I don't want to oversell it, but there's a couple types of markets that have already started to play out and have some real implications on uh, wetland conservation and restoration. The first is that there are a variety of voluntary carbon markets out there. These are carbon markets where you're not required to participate in them. If you are a company and you think it helps generate you know, uh, shareholder goodwill to show that you are environmentally conscious, you can offset your carbon emissions in a voluntary carbon market. And this is, you know, on the order of $200 million in 2016 within the United States. So this is not a tiny amount of money. Within these voluntary carbon markets, there are already methodologies approved that allow you to basically sell the carbon associated with wetland conservation or wetland restoration. Okay. The other type of market, and this is the one that exists in California as a result of AB 32, is a so-called compliance market. So AB 32 is the California Global Warming Solutions Act. It has the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the state of California back to 1990 levels by the year 2020. Right? So this is a major statewide initiative designed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. One of the ways that you can do this is actually to design projects that take greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it for very long periods of time. Taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and storing it for long periods of time is what wetlands do best. 
right? Now, within the and, and in a compliance market, you, there are entities that are legally required to participate in this market. And so the scale of this looks very different in the voluntary market. Now, as of now, there is not a methodology that's been approved in California for wetland conservation and restoration. But the carbon market, the compliance market that exists in California is very interested in trying to develop that methodology. I've served, served as a reviewer for multiple drafts of the protocols that are being considered for wetland uh, carbon sequestration in the context of AB 32. They've also taken some of the revenue that is generated from this compliance market and put that revenue back into practice projects. Basically put something like $20 million towards wetland restoration projects with the idea that these can be case studies to see if we might be able to quantify and sell the carbon that's stored in those wetland restoration projects. And so this policy implication of blue carbon is what makes the conservation community and the coastal management community so excited about this ecological principle. All right. So I'm going to show you just a handful of examples of some of the blue carbon work that we've been doing at Chapman University uh, down, in, down in Orange. So uh, I've been at Chapman for uh, 11 years. When I'm not serving in, in an administrative capacity, I'm associated with the biology and the environmental science and policy programs. And I think the best part of my job is working with really talented undergraduate students on these real world, real science questions. Chapman University does not have a graduate program in biology. Chapman University does not have a graduate program in environmental science and policy. So all of the work that I'm going to be talking about today is done with undergraduate collaborators. These are amazing students, and I am incredibly proud of the work that they have done. So this is some of the work that's being done in my lab at Chapman University. We are proudly the Swamp Monsters. We've got a great logo. We're really excited about it. Uh, and I'm just going to show you sort of snippets, three snippets of the sorts of things that we've been working on uh, at Chapman. All right. So the first is a question that we did at the Huntington Beach wetlands. And so there's, uh, this is a series of four different wetland complexes that have been dis uh, restored by the, wetland, uh, by the Huntington Beach Wetland Conservancy uh, for a number of years. And so we went back to two of these marshes. We went to the Brookhurst Marsh, which at the time that we did this project had been restored for two years. And we went back to Talbert Marsh, which at the time that we did this project had been restored for 22 years. And let me say that this project was done as part of an upper division ecosystem ecology class that I teach. And so this is the laboratory component of that class where I get 20 students who have to do whatever I tell them to do. And so I put them to work answering questions that I am excited to answer. And so the question that we were exploring here is if blue carbon is going to be a thing, if wetlands are going to sequester carbon and we want to sell that carbon back on a market or trade that carbon back in a market, then we would expect that the amount of carbon in a young marsh is less than the amount of carbon in an old marsh. So what we do is we send those 20 students out into the field. This is fantastic. Uh, university legal departments love this stuff because you say, well, what I need to do is I need to take these 20 kids, I'm going to put them in a van, I'm going to drive them down to Huntington Beach, and then they're going to use this big, sharp metal tube. And I'm going to have them, it's fine. I mean, this is a razor blade on the end, but we'll be really careful. We, you know, we, we got a system. And the system is we put it in the ground, and then we have one of them stand on top of it and jump up and down. And yeah, so it's, it's totally fine. Everybody was, everybody was very safe. Um, and so we do this, and we take these cores from the Talbert wetland, the older wetland, and we take these cores from the Brookhurst wetland, the younger wetland, and we section them up into small increments, and then we bring it back into the lab, and we measure how much carbon is in the soil. And again, the question here is, is there more carbon in the older wetland than there is in the younger wetland? And so we spend a lot of time getting people to measure a bunch of things for me, and here's what the data look like. And so this is a soil profile. And so here we're starting at the top of the wetland soil. And we're going down just about 50 centimeters. We actually go down as, as f it depends on how heavy that person on the top of the core is, right? If you get a big, a big person in there, you can go down to 50 centimeters. If you have a, you know, a more lightweight class, you, know, you stop at 35 or something like that. And then what we're looking for is the percentage of that soil that is carbon. So how much of that, if you have 100 grams of soil, how many grams of carbon do you have in that soil depth increment? And so the young marsh, the black marsh, uh, so the young marsh, Brookhurst marsh, in black dots, the one that we expect to have very little carbon is here. And the one that is 20 years older that we expect to have more carbon is here. 
Yes. So this is the beauty of science uh, and the beauty, there's a, there's a fine educational lesson here. People see why students get frustrated with a project like this, right? So we build it all up and blue carbon's important and wetlands are better at this than anything else in the world. And so they're gonna be sequestering carbon and the longer you let the wetland go, the more carbon that you're gonna have. And you can see that in the young marsh, you have way more carbon than in the old marsh. Why? And what this tells us, we actually have some, we have some good ideas about why. It turns out that it's not just the age of the marsh, it's also what you start with, right? So we did a follow-up project to test that hypothesis, and it turns out that, that, of course, that's true. So it turns out that in this young marsh, Brookhurst, this was a marsh that prior to restoration still looked really good, right? There was still pickleweed in that marsh. It hadn't had tidal conductivity for 30 or 40 years, but that pickleweed, that really hardy salt marsh plant, was still hanging on. And so there was a lot of carbon stored in that soil because it hadn't been completely destroyed. Whereas Talbert was essentially a parking lot prior to restoration, right? And so what we learned here is that starting conditions really matter, okay? Not surprising, but you don't know that until you go out and measure it. And it shows some of the complexity of trying to move blue carbon into these market systems. You can't just say, well, this is a marsh that's been restored for 30 years, so this is how much carbon it has. You need to know a lot more information if you want to quantify how much carbon is stored in these systems. Uh, this is something that we published in the Bulletin of the Southern California Academy of Science, and one of my greatest achievements in the past 11 years is that that paper had nine undergraduate co-authors on it, which is not bad from a college class. Two more projects that we've talked about or that I'm gonna talk about with you today. And these have less to do with soil carbon and more to do with greenhouse gas fluxes. So I've explained already that because these systems are anaerobic, because there's no oxygen, that's why they store so much soil carbon, right? The lack of oxygen for the microbes to breathe describes why there's so much carbon tied up in these soil ecosystems. There's an added complication though. Because those very same conditions that allow for dead Danes or dead vegetation to build up in wetland environments, those very same conditions create situations where different sets of soil microbes come in and instead of releasing carbon dioxide, they release things like methane, CH4, and they release things like nitrous oxide, N2O. These are incredibly potent greenhouse gases. Right, The constant release of one methane molecule is the same as the release of 45 carbon dioxide molecules. The constant release of one nitrous oxide molecule, so a constant flux of nitrous oxide, is equivalent to a constant flux of 270 carbon dioxides. So this adds even more complexity to the situation. If we want to restore blue carbon systems, because they are taking this greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere, we better make sure that they are not putting these more potent greenhouse gases back into the atmosphere, right? And so if you are a system that's trying to slow down global warming and you are putting out one of these, you need to take up at least 270 carbon dioxides to cancel that out. And so small amounts of the release of these greenhouse gases have really big impacts on understanding the climate impacts of these coastal ecosystems. And so we've been involved in a handful of projects around the state looking at greenhouse gas fluxes from some of these coastal blue carbon projects. And the first one that I'm gonna talk about is actually over here at the Seal Beach National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, also, another thing that university legal departments love is that when you tell them you're taking undergraduate students to an active gun range on a naval reserve. <laughs> so we had to actually take a live munitions training course, just in case you are working and digging a hole in this wetland and you find live munitions, you know what to do. Anybody want to guess what the right response is if you find a live munition? Yeah, get out, right? So it's a very short training, but we went through it. All the students go through it. It adds a little bit of, you have to call and make sure the gun range isn't active before you go sample at the site. Has anybody been to Seal Beach National Wildlife Refuge? They, they open this up periodically for, for public visitors. This is one of the most beautiful wetland sites that I have ever seen in my career. It is absolutely 
lovely. It is amazing what happens if you have property and you are the Navy and no one is allowed to access it. It has just beautiful landscape. I mean, you can still see major roads in the back and there's oil derricks and all that sort of thing. But if you look past those, it is an absolutely lovely site. If you're looking for a, a fun wetland to visit, go visit the CLB National Wildlife Refuge. Okay, so this is, a, is one of the largest sort of remnant wetlands that we still have left in, in this part of Southern California, something like 965 acres. Uh, the problem with Seal Beach National Wildlife Refuge is that for a variety of reasons, including oil extraction, this is a particularly low elevation marsh. It exists, we took all the oil out from under it, which means that the marsh itself sunk which means that this marsh is threatened by sea level rise. So all of the modeling, all the mathematical modeling that we can do with the USGS and other government agencies suggests that as sea level rises, this wetland isn't going to be able to keep pace, right? If we leave this wetland alone, this wetland will be lost within the next 100 years or so. It's just not able to grow in the way a wetland would if it wasn't surrounded by urban development and if it hadn't had all the oil taken out from under it. And so the project at Steel Beach Wildlife Refuge was what's called a thin layer sediment augmentation project. And so what they do is they have to dredge the harbor right there by Seal Beach to allow for navigation. And usually when you dredge a harbor, you take all the sediment out from the bottom and then you go dump it somewhere, right? You treat it like waste. Here what they did is they said, aha, we have a wetland that needs sediment. It needs to grow. And so rather than dumping that dredge material somewhere inland, we're gonna spread some of that dredge material on top of that wetland. With the idea now that you've given this wetland a head start and allowed it to persist for the next 100 years in the face of sea level rise. By giving it this 10 inch head start, the idea is that that's enough for this wetland persist for the next 100 years, okay? Now, if we're conserving the wetland and we're allowing the wetland to grow for the next 100 years, there's of course the potential to quantify how much carbon is being added to the landscape and bring this into carbon markets. This is one of the projects that was funded by the Compliance Carbon Market in Southern California. This is one of the pilot projects that that AB32 market funded. And so this is what this looks like, right? This is a really cool heavy machinery project. They designed this special spray hose where they can, it's called a rainbow arc technique, where they take big uh, piles of the dredge material and then they spray it out in this rainbow pattern over the marsh to get a 10 layer surface. And they drive this kind of wetland tank around to make sure that everything's working. And what we were able to do is come into that site with some really talented undergraduate students and measure whether or not the system is releasing greenhouse gases. Does the addition of this thin layer augmentation increase methane fluxes or increase nitrous oxide fluxes? And if it does, that's going to offset all the carbon that's stored in this system in the context of, of blue carbon carbon sequestration. So what we learned, we were on this project for about three years. We went out and we measured greenhouse gas fluxes every couple of months uh, on this project. And it looks like both of these potent greenhouse gases, both methane and nitrous oxide, had incredibly small fluxes at this site. This is not a site that's releasing a lot of these potent greenhouse gases, which suggests that projects like this might be really good candidates for blue carbon credits if we ever design a protocol that's accepted as part of this compliance market. So a positive story here that we were happy to contribute to. The last project that I'm gonna to talk to you about today actually takes place up in the San Francisco Bay. Um, for those of you that don't know, the south of the San Francisco Bay, which is what you're looking at right here, used to be surrounded by salt marshes, like much of coastal California. Uh, 1800s, all of those salt marshes were drained and converted into salt ponds. This is where we get sea salt from. Essentially what you do is you take each one of these little outlines here that has a letter, that's a different pond. And those all used to be marshes, and you get, rid of the, you get rid of those pesky marshes, because of course you do, because they're in the way. Uh, you get rid of those pesky marshes and you convert them into ponds, and then you pull the seawater in and you allow it to evaporate. It gets a little more salty. And then you move it to the next pond and you allow it to evaporate, and so on and so on, until you end up with purified sea salt. And this has been happening in, in the south of San Francisco Bay for, for just about 100 years or so. The technology has gotten considerably better over that 100 years. And they can now make the same amount of sea salt in a fraction of the area. And so the South Bay Salt, Bay salt Pond Restoration Project has a goal of restoring 15,000 acres of salt ponds back to wetland habitats, including salt marsh habitats. They want to put all of these things that used to be salt marshes back to salt marshes. 
This is the largest restoration project on the West Coast, and obviously there's some potential blue carbon implications here. If all of those uh, salt ponds, which don't store carbon, are converted into salt marshes, which do star store carbon, and you can trade that carbon on a carbon market, that creates a significant revenue stream for a project of this scale. So we were involved in this project to look to see if these systems make methane at all. This is one of the, my favorite projects that I've ever worked on because it allowed me to buy kayaks, which <laughs> is fantastic. Also something cal uh, legal departments love. Um, so we had some kayaks. This is Haley Miller. She graduated uh, two years ago from Chapman Environmental Science and Policy. She's starting a master's program at Clemson working on mangrove biogeochemistry next fall. And so what we did is in the salt ponds, we had these chambers that we deployed and we had to paddle out of them in these kayaks and we sampled the greenhouse gases that were coming into these chambers. Now this is actually not particularly easy because you are in a kayak. And so Haley was fantastic. She had this amazing level of patience where you kind of bob up to these things and you can't bump them and you can't hold on to anything and you're trying to get a syringe and sample the headspace really, really quickly before you float away. And we did this for several hundred chambers over the course of about a year in the South, of, uh, South Bay. And so what Haley found, uh, and she submitted this work for publication already, is that surprisingly these salt ponds, and some of these salt ponds because of this historical legacy are incredibly salty. Uh, they are three times saltier than, than seawater. Right? This is a rough place to make a living biologically. Surprisingly, some of these highly saline ponds are actually releasing measurable amounts of methane. Right? And some spots, so this is looking at um, this is looking at weirs. These are highly regulated systems. And there's some parts of these ponds that have so much methane, it's actually bubbling out. So there's some parts of these highly saline ponds that are releasing just gobs and gobs of methane. This has some really cool potential conservation implications because we want to restore the salt ponds back to salt marshes. In doing so, we're creating a system that stores carbon. If the salt ponds release methane, but the salt marshes don't release methane. Not only are we storing more carbon, but we're decreasing the amount of methane that's going into the atmosphere. This is essentially a double benefit of these restoration projects from a climate change perspective. And our back of the envelope calculations, which are still somewhat preliminary and very rough, suggest that by including methane in these calculations, the amount of greenhouse gas benefit that you get from restoration increases on the order of 10 to 15 percent. So by understanding the biogeochemistry of methane here, of greenhouse gases in this system, you're actually going to be able to get even more carbon credits out of these restorations if that's what you choose to do. Again, somewhat preliminary. I don't want to overstate this. I'm not saying that every salt pond in the world does this. But we have some really exciting data that suggests more work is necessary here. So let me sort of wrap things up and, and try and come back uh, to a couple main points. I want to suggest that we've had a changing perspective on how we think about wetlands as a society. For a long time, we viewed these things as dark, scary places, things that were in the way of progress, things that we wanted to get off of the landscape. And because of that view, we were really good at getting these things off of that landscape. As science has evolved and as society has begun to think about these systems wetland differently, we now recognize that they're not in the way. These aren't negative systems. These are actually systems that provide us with a great number of benefits. And that shift in perspective has been one of the major drivers of restoration and conservation uh, efforts in these wetland ecosystems. One of the services that has risen to the top as services that we should be thinking about in these wetland ecosystems is the fact that coastal ecosystems store lots of carbon. They are better at this than any other ecosystem on the world. Which means that there are now exciting policy opportunities around wetland conservation and, wet and wetland restoration. As we move towards a place where carbon has a dollar value because of emerging carbon markets, both voluntary and compliance-based markets, systems that store carbon become valuable to us as a society. That creates potential financial benefits and financial incentives for bringing some of these wetlands back onto the landscape. The work that we're doing at Chapman University is trying to understand the scientific questions behind those restorations. How much carbon? 
How many greenhouse gases? Can we predict how much carbon is in a system? What do we need to do to measure how much carbon is taken out of the atmosphere, how much greenhouse gas is taken out of the atmosphere and stored in these blue carbon ecosystems? I think that there are exciting scientific questions here. It's been my joy to work with undergraduates to try and wrestle with some of those questions. And I think getting students engaged in questions that have real world policy implications has just been a lot of fun. And so with that, let me thank everybody for their attention. I want to thank uh, Chapman University Schmidt College of Science and Technology. If anybody is ever down in Orange, we have a brand new science building. It is just beautiful. I would be delighted to show you around. If you know people that are looking for a place to do an undergraduate degree in the sciences, I would be delighted to show them around too as dean. Uh, I want to make sure that I, I thank my undergraduate students that did all of the work that I talked about today. Uh, I've worked with just oodles and oodles of talented undergraduate students, and it's one of the most fun parts of my job at Chapman. The work that we've done has been funded by the EPA, California Coastal Commission, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And with that, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions that people have. Thank you so much. I can see none of you, so if you have questions, <laughs> speak up. <laughs> I can see you, yes. Um, so how, what can people do to get them to do more swamp restoration? I mean, so that more area of this gets done. Yeah, that's a, that's a really big and tricky question, right? And I think what I, what I don't want to suggest is that everybody go out and start arguing for blue carbon credits, right? There are, there are lots of other ecosystem services that can drive wetland restoration and that have been incredibly successful at driving wetland restorations, right? The habitat component of wetlands is one of the major drivers of restoration, and it is still a very valuable reason to restore wetlands, right? So we need more active birders in the world, uh, arguing that these birds are worth having on the landscape, especially these threatened and endangered species, and that's been a real push for, for wetland restoration. I think the carbon piece is just an added benefit to this, right? If we can restore these things for all the other great things that they do, and we can you know, help the climate simultaneously, it's this sort of win-win situation. So I think you know, community activism around restoration has been a huge part of restoration. Community engagement in the actual restoration activities is a big deal in Southern California. There's lots of volunteer opportunities out there. If these are systems that people care about and they make that known, that's what drives these restorations. So I don't know that carbon is the only argument that's gonna get these things back on the landscape. It is one more argument that we might use to pull some of these things back onto the landscape. Uh, I'll go to the back, sure. Um, since carbon restoration, since wetland restoration in, say, Long Beach is probably impossible, is the focus going to be on less populated uh, sections of coastland? And if so, aren't there a lot of wetlands already there, or are they all gone? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, right? If you look at Southern California, where are you going to put them, right? Um, they can't retreat back in, right? So the wetlands that we have have a barrier. They can't retreat back in as the sea level rises. Uh, and the idea that you can buy up Southern California coast for a wetland restoration project at the cost of real estate in Southern California is really hard. So there's, there's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really big question, right? So do we think of this at a regional scale? Do we think of this at a national scale? Do we think of this at an international scale? Uh, there are some places like the World Bank that are really excited about thinking about that question at the international scale. If we think of carbon off offsets as addressing a global problem, like global greenhouse gas emissions, then maybe it doesn't matter so much where the wetlands are. Right? And so there's, the World Bank is looking at this as sort of a development opportunity. If you have a country with lots of wetlands left because it hasn't developed those wetlands yet, there's all sorts of pressure for those wetlands to get developed and turned into shrimp farms or turned into something else. If you can now create a financial incentive to conserve the wetlands that exist in other parts of the world, and you can support the communities that are there in a more sustainable way, World Bank is very excited about that question. It raises some really interesting challenges, though, because now, Long Beach, right, who lost all their wetlands and lost all the ecosystem services associated with those wetlands, is basically funding restoration someplace else in the world, and they're not getting any of those other services back. And so is that really equal? Are we okay with that, right? And that's a really challenging sociology question 
I think, and sort of social systems, political systems question. So it's one that people are definitely thinking about, and I don't think there's a clear-cut answer. I think it's a question of what do we choose to value, what scale do we want to think about this problem on, uh, and that has all sorts of challenges for policy. If California policy, which is what AB 32 is, should AB 32 California climate policy be approving projects outside of California, right? And that's a hard question and one that people are really actively wrestling with. But it's very true. In the, in the places that have probably experienced the greatest losses, many of those places also, uh, are, it's impossible to put the wetlands back. Yeah, it's a great question. Was there one here? How does this compare with the potential catastrophe of the permafrost melting and releasing all of that carbon? Yeah, so it's all the same biogeochemistry. Uh, so these northern systems, like bogs and, and permafrost systems, so permafrost systems tend to be relatively shallow wetlands, but they're highly organic soil. It is, um, if you buy peat moss at Home Depot or Lowe's, that's the vegetation that you find in most of these permafrost systems. It's, it's pure carbon, right? You can burn it for energy, it's pure carbon. But it's relatively shallow. It's been protected because it's permafrost. It's really, really cold. And so these things are under a layer of ice, and once it gets under that layer of ice, it tends to stick around forever. As you warm permafrost up, and that ice begins to melt, you have all of this carbon just sitting there, waiting for microbes to attack it. And under those anaerobic conditions, they can release lots and lots of methane. So it, it depends. Uh, so this is a question of, again, what scale are we talking about? Right? If suddenly all of the permafrost in the world warmed up by 10 degrees, that has the potential to re release massive amounts of methane. Right? You're probably not going to combat that by restoring you know, uh, the Huntington Beach wetlands. Right? Um, so the, the scale of these things and, and the question of what are we, th are we talking about regionally, are we talking about all these sorts of things, you know, lots of underlying science questions there. They're the same biogeochemistry and the same challenges of trying to scale these things up. And I don't know that anybody's, I've never seen a paper where people have said, well, let's imagine that all the permafrost changes in this way and releases this much methane. How many salt marshes would we need to restore to offset that loss? I don't know that anybody's ever run that. It would be an interesting back of the envelope problem to try and run. Um, and it could be, you know, the permafrost piece is a huge piece of the climate, right? Yeah. Uh, do these um, processes of absorbing carbon dioxide, does that apply to salt marsh or fresh water or both? Yes. Both. So all wetlands do this to various degrees. Um, salt marshes per unit area, these blue carbon systems per unit area are really, really good at it. So if you look at where all the carbon is in the world, so carbon, salt marshes, these blue carbon systems, the rate of carbon accretion is huge. But because they're limited to coastal zones, the total amount of carbon in coastal wetlands is relatively small, right? Freshwater systems, especially permafrost and northern peatland ecosystems, they sequester carbon. They store carbon very, very slowly. But they've been doing that since the last glaciation about 10,000 years ago. And so the pool of carbon there is, is massive. So there's something like 500 petagrams of carbon in those freshwater, northern, and uh, tropical peatland ecosystems. Again, the things where you get peat moss out of. That's 500 with 10 to the 15 zeros after it grams of carbon. That's 60 times more carbon than we release annually from fossil fuel burning. So that stock of carbon in northern systems in Minnesota and Alaska and boreal zones, and actually we're finding more and more peatlands uh, along the equator, that stock of carbon is massive, but it's slowly being added into the system. And so again, this is getting to your question, right? So we've got one that has a ton of uh, carbon stored there, which if it suddenly goes up into the atmosphere is gonna be a really big challenge. But restoring those doesn't suck a lot of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in any given year. So for those peatland ecosystems and permafrost systems, oftentimes the conversation is more about conservation. How do we protect those things? How do we make sure that they stay wet and don't get drained? Whereas for salt marshes, the pool of carbon, the, the mass of carbon is relatively small, but we can suck it away really fast. And so if we put small areas back on the landscape, we're sucking lots of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So freshwater wetlands do this as well. Now, freshwater wetlands, the challenge with freshwater wetlands and the reason why blue carbon systems are so exciting for, for uh, carbon sequestration 
is that the methane, this potent greenhouse gas, methane does not get made if you have lots of sulfate around. So methane is made by microbes, microbes that live in your gut, right? You release methane, your, wet, your, your gut is like a miniature wetland. Uh, those microbes, that, everything's a miniature wetland. If you take my class, you know that everything is ultimately a wetland. Your gut is a, is a wetland, and there are certain types of microbes that live in your gut that when they break down the food that you eat, they breathe out methane, okay? Those microbes are just barely eking out a living. The energy that you get from making methane is tiny, right? If there's biochemists in the room, the delta G of methanogenesis is just enough to actually make an ATP molecule. Right? It is the hardest possible way to make a living biochemistry. So if you're a methanogen, if you're a microbe that releases methane, you only are able to do that if there's nobody else around. Any other microbe that can make a living biochemically any other way beats you to the food. And so there's another group of microbe called sulfate reducers. How many people have ever smelled a rotten egg? That's because of sulfate reducers. Those are microbes that instead of breathing oxygen, those microbes are breathing sulfate. Breathing sulfate gives you more energy than making methane. And so if there's a piece of dead vegetation and there's a methane microbe and a sulfate microbe, the sulfate microbe gets the vegetation every time, which means that methane's not being made. The reason why blue carbon systems are so exciting for carbon storage is that ocean water has a lot of sulfate in it. If you ever walked by a coastal wetland, what does it smell like? Smells like a rotten egg, because most of the microbes there are breathing sulfate. And so part of the reason why blue carbon systems are so appealing for a carbon sequestration thing is that biochemically we know that they shouldn't make very much methane. Now, freshwater systems can store a lot more carbon, but if they're making methane, the net climate impact tends to be closer to neutral, whereas uh, a salt marsh tends to just be uh, a, carbon, uh, a climate benefit. That was a very long answer, to, and I'm not even sure it was the answer to the question you asked. But there's a lot of biogeochemistry for you, so. Anything else that I can answer for people? Uh, yeah, please. Um, when the different layers continue to build on top of uh, each other, yeah. does that put pressure on the lower la layers? And does that form coal and possibly even diamonds at very much lower? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, right? I, not, everybody, everybody go out and dig out all the wetlands. That's where all the diamonds are, people. <laughs> Uh, no. So what we know is that, um, I mean, the fossil fuels that we're, we're burning today, right, oil and natural gas, those are essentially the wetland soils and the, and the marine sediments from millennia ago. Coal uh, that we burn today is essentially the wetland sediments from freshwater swamps from millennia ago. So yes, eventually as that stuff gets deeper and deeper and processed over tens and hundreds of thousands of years, it will condense into things like fossil fuels. So again, everything is a wetland. Fossil fuels are also connected to anaerobic biogeochemistry and wetland ecosystems. And that gives you some sense of how much carbon we're talking about, right? I mean, blue carbon is all about this imbalance. It's all about the fact that there's extra carbon that sticks around in ecosystems. There's so much carbon that sticks around in these wetland ecosystems that if you leave it alone for a couple hundred thousand years, you can power an entire society on it. That's how much carbon we're talking about. And it's the exact same process, right? Those anaerobic wetland systems are what ultimately generate uh, fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, you answered half my question. Great. The methane. Uh, what about the nitrous oxide? Why is that lower in, in the salt marsh? So nitrous oxide is even trickier biochemistry. There's two groups of microbes. There are. Everybody's going. to, Yeah. People. Everybody just gets up and leaves when I. All right. So look. So in the same way that there are microbes that can breathe sulfate and those are sulfate reducers, that would make, that's what make rotten eggs. There are also microbes that can breathe nitrate, NO3. And so there are microbes out there that instead of using oxygen are using NO3. They're called denitrifiers. This is why we have treatment wetlands. So people know that we have sometimes, so if you go to a sewage treatment plant, also just a wetland, uh, one of the final, or one of the processes in a sewage treatment plant is to run the water through a wetland ecosystem. 
right? And we do that to remove nitrate, which is what causes dead zones in coastal systems. The microbes that do that are denitrifiers. They're taking nitrate, NO3. They're using that in place of oxygen, and they actually breathe out uh, dinitrogen gas, N2, the gas that is 78% of the atmosphere. So wetlands are the kidneys of the landscape. One of the pollutants they remove incredibly effectively is nitrogen, and they permanently remove it. They stick it into an inert form up in the atmosphere. That's a multi-step process. There's multiple enzymes involved in denitrification, and it's not a perfectly efficient system. So a small amount of one of the intermediates in that denitrification process is N2O, okay? So uh, there's also another process called nitrification, which also releases uh, 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 nitrous oxide as an intermediate. What we know from biogeochemistry is that the amount of uh, the amount of that inefficiency, so how much of the greenhouse gas gets released from denitrification, depends on how much nitrate you start with. And it's only in the most polluted, highly eutrophic, nitrogen-enriched, we're dumping fertilizer on the thing, it's the sewage outflow that goes into a wetland, it's only that level of nitrate that leads to uh, nitrous oxide coming off the system. And, in most cases. And so uh, the vast majority of coastal systems around the world do not face that level of nitrogen pollution. And so that explains why nitrous oxide flux from many of these systems are so low. Now there's gonna be exceptions to that, of course. And the biogeochemistry around nitrogen is so much more complicated than the biogeochemistry around methane that that's actually a, a, a much harder question. It's even a harder question to tackle than methane. And understanding when and why nitrous oxide comes off of a marsh is something that we don't have as good of an idea about yet. Yes? So in your lab, how did you measure the carbon in those core samples? I'm just curious what type of uh, instruments you use. Yeah, so uh, there's a couple of different instruments that you can, you can use to use this. So we call those the soil cookies. Uh, the easiest way to do this is to essentially use what amounts to a, a kiln, right? And so we know that organic matter burns off, right, at, at 451 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a whole Ray Badbury book about it. Uh, and so if you take a soil cookie and you put it in a, a little crucible, a ceramic cup, essentially, and you weigh it, so you, first you dry it and you get all the water out and you weigh it, and it weighs 100 grams. That's how much soil is there. Then you heat it up to 800 degrees, 600 degrees, anything above that Fahrenheit 451 number, all of the organic matter will essentially burn off, and you can do this in a kiln. We do it in a muffle furnace, but that's just a fancy kiln. Uh, you do this in a kiln, all of the organic matter burns off, it gets converted to carbon dioxide. You then let it cool down, and you take your ceramic cup back out, and you weigh it, and now it only weighs 20 grams. Well, you know that 80% of that soil was carbon, organic carbon. Now there's more sophisticated instruments that can do this as well. We have what's known as an elemental analyzer. It essentially works the same way, except instead of measuring the mass loss, it measures the amount of carbon dioxide that burns off. So in this one, you take very tiny amounts of soil, you put it in a little tinfoil ball, you drop it into a furnace that flash burns it at you know 1200 degrees C or something like that. That converts all of the organic carbon to carbon dioxide and then you measure the amount of carbon dioxide that comes off using a piece of equipment called a gas chromatograph. And so essentially you're looking at either the loss of organic matter as a mass loss, or you're looking at the mass of organic matter as carbon dioxide that's basically being burned off, and you can measure it either way. Both are actually super easy to get students to do. The kiln one is really easy. You need a scale, you need a kiln, and you need tongs so that people don't burn themselves. Right? That, so that for this project, we actually use the, the organic matter. It's called loss on ignition. We use the loss on ignition method for that one. Yeah? Yes, thank you, Dr. Keller. What a fantastic talk.